Would you stand in reverence as we read from the Holy Scriptures this morning from the book of Job, first verse out of chapter 1, and then we'll jump to chapter 2. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a pot's herd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Faithful and true are the words of God. So our series this month is The Struggle is Real. We're looking at struggles any and all of us might deal with in our own lives. Last week we looked at facing danger, today we're talking about facing calamity. We're looking to these ancient scriptures to see if they have clues for us in how to deal with danger and calamity, darkness and despair, those difficult times that we all face. We're looking for clues to how we can grow in our faith, how we can find courage and endurance for the difficult times. When life takes a turn that you did not expect or takes a turn for the worst, what does faith have to say to us? When tragedy strikes or suffering seems to just surround us and engulf us, does faith have anything to say to us? What can our faith do for us in those kind of times? We're going to be looking at Job for the next several weeks for some of these clues and answers. In the way the Bible is laid out, this is a part of what we call the wisdom literature. Last week we read from Esther. Right after Esther is the book of Job. Right behind Job come the Psalms. They all deal with some of these kinds of questions. Job, though, is a theological treatise or essay, but it's told in a narrative form. It's a story of Job and some of his friends and this conversation that's going on between God and Satan in the heavenly realm. But the wisdom literature tends to be a little more reflective about life and questioning of why things happen the way they do in our lives. Job mainly is dealing with the problem of explaining suffering in human life, particularly looking at unjust suffering as Job is said to be a righteous and upright man. When the story begins in chapter 1, it just starts with, there was once a man. And then in chapter 2, it begins one day. In our time, we might just start it by saying, once upon a time, and tell the story. It sounds a lot like the way Jesus starts his parable when he says things like there was a man who had two sons or there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell into the hands of robbers. The way this story begins is a tip that this is not just about this man 
but could be about any man or any woman. It's a tip for us to listen. The way the story begins, all but says, pay attention here, there's something for you in this. I'm going to tell you about a man, but there's more to the story than just what happens to this man. There are bigger questions being answered. There are bigger themes being explored. A word about Satan. In Job, Satan is living in heaven. He's one of the heavenly beings. Most of us have been taught that Satan is somewhere right here, this evil and demonic personification of evil that's here to plague us not quite the same in job satan's working for god satan is one of the heavenly beings been sent to watch over the earth bring god a report let god know what's going on on earth things god needs to know and the passage we read today is primarily this conversation between Satan and God about us, about what's happening on earth, about who humans are. Satan's argument is that humans are most often and mostly selfish. Satan doesn't have a very high view of you and me. He's basically saying to God, they only have faith because you throw blessings at them if things ever turn. And it's not all just right with them they will not respect you or revere you or even want to have a relationship with you god responds by saying but what about job have you noticed job job is great he's upright he's worthy he's a man of integrity he runs from evil he does good things Verse 2 in chapter 2, the Lord says to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason so if you haven't read job lately let me remind you that in chapter one this conversation sounds very much like this and god says okay let's see what happens with job if you plague him And plague him he does before you know it. In a few short verses, Job is losing everything. First his animals, his oxen and donkeys and camels. And then his servants are either killed or stolen. And then if that's not enough, Job has ten children. They're all together in a house. The house collapses and they're all killed. All in chapter 1. Job experiences this great loss. Calamity strikes early in the story and with a vengeance. Job remains steadfast in his trust and confidence in God. At the end of chapter 1, Job is mourning, but he says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So at the end of chapter 1, Job still has this great confidence in God. In chapter 2, because Job is doing so well, Satan then inflicts Job with sores head to toe. So he's in pain and itching in his own body, something he cannot get away from. And it seems to begin to cause him to ask some more questions. His wife, in fact, comes to him after she observes all that has happened to him. In verse 9, she says to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. She's saying, after all this has happened, wouldn't it be better if you just let go? 
Wouldn't it be better if you just died and finished the misery? But Job is still a man of faith, still believing in God, but maybe questioning a little bit, rather than the strong declaration he makes at the end of chapter 1, here in chapter 2, he asks a question after she says that to him. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? He's now asking a question rather than making a statement. It might signal a shift in his thinking as he's going through these trying times. I would say that's about right in my experience of loss and pain and suffering that we began to ask all kinds of questions. When I've walked through pain and suffering with other people, when they're in very difficult circumstances or have experienced great loss, either of a relationship or somehow their body has failed them or something in their life has gone badly wrong, they began to ask lots of questions. During the suffering, our minds go in all kinds of different directions. We can ask, why me? Why now? Did I do something wrong? Should I be doing something different? Why is this happening? How can God let this happen? Where is God? So many questions as we try to make rational sense out of suffering and tragedy. Job points out that sometimes, sometimes on this side of death, we cannot make sense of it or find a rational reason that would explain why. And yet throughout Job, the question looms, if we can't make rational sense of it, what does our faith have to say to us? Can our faith help us then in those times? I remember in seminary, professors raising this idea of the problem of evil and suffering and how do you justify a loving God with all the human life can present to us in terms of tragedy and suffering. At the end of every term, we had to write a 20-page, what they called a credo, a theological essay about what we had learned and how we would explain how we use what we learned in the practice of ministry. And I can remember thinking, gosh, I haven't had that much pain and suffering. I grew up in small-town America in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s. I was housed and clothed and loved. Both parents were in the home. My grandparents were close. Aunts and uncles lived in town. We had a great church home where people cared, knew my name, would help me with anything. Pastors who cared about the congregation came and went one after the other. I got a great education in the Old Moggy Public Schools. I went off to college, met great friends, had a great time. Got to seminary. And my professors are saying, but what about suffering? What about evil? Or what about tragedies, earthquakes, tornadoes, drought, war, genocide? What does your faith say about that? And the truth was, in my early 20s, I hadn't thought about that very much. I'd lived a pretty idyllic life. I mean, some things that happened, but we'd come through. It's not a problem. But they wanted to know if you're going to be in ministry and you're going to be helping people, what does your faith have to say when they're in their darkest hour? Job says, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? Job seems to be saying that we should know or expect that life is fragile and ever-changing. 
he seems to think that we should know that there's going to be good and bad. There's going to be blessings and tragedies. There's going to be joy and wonder. And there's going to be heartache and sorrow. Here is Job reeling from the loss of all of his worldly possessions, his wealth, his property, his people, the loss of his children. And he seems to be saying, did you not know that this is all a part of life on earth? This is all a part of life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I wouldn't have said it quite like that. But Job is saying, I understand that life is fragile and bad things can happen even to good and upright people. The wisdom literature is struggling to contrast the foolish with the wise. And Job's representing the wise here and says, this is all a part of what life on earth is all about. I also thought of Ecclesiastes. You've probably heard this in song and in verse. Again, part of the wisdom literature that says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to to dance Job seems to be saying to his wife don't you know God is with us in the good and the bad don't you know God is still God remind me of John Wesley on his deathbed there were people around him They could tell he was trying to speak. He was trying to say something. They couldn't understand what he was saying until finally they understood he was saying the best of all is God is with us. Through it all, God is with us. Despite whatever external circumstances you may be experiencing, God is with you. It made me think of when we see these news stories of families gone through a tragedy of tornadoes blown away their home or their house is burned down and the camera crew shows up from the news station and they say, how are you doing? It makes me want to say, I'm doing terrible. My house just burned down. But they're all so nice. And even in the midst of their tragedy, they usually say something like, well, the house is gone, but my family is here. And so everything's going to be all right. These relationships of love make all the difference. It's the relationships of love that get us through It's true in our lives, but it's also true with God. When we know we have a relationship with God and we believe that God loves us and we've responded in love, then it's those relationships with one another and with God that carry us through. It's those that in those times of suffering, of tragedy, of heartbreak, of sorrow, when we're not sure if we can take the next step, that our relationship with God can give us strength and courage and endurance because we know that God is with us and God loves us. Do you know the name Margaret Powers? 
Didn't really know this name until I read her story recently. She grew up in Canada. She was coming of age in the 1960s. She talks about when she was falling in love with a young man. And all of a sudden, the relationship began to move a little more quickly than she was ready for. He began to ask her if she was ready to get married. She had lots of reservations, so she kept raising these red flags. I don't know. Can we get through this? I don't know if we could survive that. I Finally, on Thanksgiving weekend, they were together away on a retreat. They were out walking by a lake, and she was raising one reservation after another as her boyfriend said, I'm ready to go to your dad and ask for your hand. She still was raising objections. Finally, he said to her, Margie, if there comes a time when you can't handle it and I can't handle it, That will be when the Lord takes care of us. They went on through their day's activities. She went to bed, but she said it was a restless night. She just could not sleep. Finally, in the middle of the night, she woke up and started to write. And the words, she said, just began to tumble out. What she wrote that night became the poem known as Footprints. You may have heard it before tells the story of a person walking along a beach thinking about their life and looking back at their life and as they look back over the course of their life they realize that often there were two sets of footprints but at the worst times of their life there were only one set of footprints the poem ends like this lord You told me when I decided to follow you, you would walk and talk with me all the way. But I'm aware that during the most troublesome times of my life, there's only one set of footprints. I just don't understand why. When I needed you most, you leave me. God whispered, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. It was then that I carried you. Amen. And thanks be to God.